welcome to the Not All Better Show. I'm your host, Paul Vogelzang, and this is episode number 205. As part of our Art of Living interview series, our guest today on the Not Old Better Show is author John Butman. John Butman is an American writer and has written several books under his own name and collaborated on more than 30 other titles, including New York Times and Boston Globe bestsellers and Economist Award winners. John Butman's latest book, along with co-author Simon Target, New World Incorporated, The Making of America by England's Merchant Adventurers, is part history book and part swashbuckling tale about the making of America. The story of the making of America actually begins in England in the mid-1500s, 70 years before the Mayflower set out to brave the westerly gales and cross the Atlantic. That, of course, is our guest today, author John Butman. Please join me in welcoming to the Not Old Better Show via internet telephone, John Butman. John Butman, welcome to the show. Thank you, Paul. It's great to be with you. I really, I have to tell you, I really enjoyed your your new book, New World Incorporated, and I want to talk about that. But, I, but I want to talk about this first question that I have, kind of the founding of America from from your book and and this real dichotomy almost. So we we learn in grade school about the colonization, about the pilgrims, about religious freedom. You know, I found this quote that you used from John Winthrop about building a city on the hill. Really, it's not so much about that. It's more about kind of failed business efforts, uh, investment capital, gold, silver, <laughs> t- all of that. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's so fascinating to me that we live with this myth of the pilgrims that we all learn in grade school and that we, we kind of love and we sort of accept without really looking at it very hard, you know. Um and, and the idea is that the pilgrims sailed over in 1620 and they had one ship and they were all alone and nothing else had ever happened before them. And they established themselves on Cape Cod and that started America. Mm-hmm. And that the reason they came was for religious freedom. And really nothing about that is, is accurate. And I have nothing against the pilgrims <laughs> or the pilgrim myth. Uh, you know, I'm a descendant of of a, of a pilgrim, William Bradford, who is the second governor. Uh, and there are some 30 million Americans who are somehow related to the, the original group on the Mayflower. But it, it just ignores uh, what was an enormous and long 70-year period of basically business innovation uh, that started in 1550-ish and proceeded for – this period of almost 70 years um, and, and that had really very little to do with the pilgrims or religious freedom. It was almost entirely driven by uh, commercial uh, needs. And so when we started, my, my co-author Simon Target and I started looking into this. We, we thought about it for a long time independently, um, but we started looking into it more deeply and it, it really struck us just how uh, far off the, the myth is and how deeply fascinating the real story is. It is fascinating. It, it's also really exciting. I, I really enjoyed it. And uh, I really want to encourage my, my audience to uh, check out the book New World. And it's exciting in the sense that there are all these new things that are brought up. I, I was really very unaware that, that, you know, there's a first stock offering mentioned. There's new mm-hmm. trading partners. There's new world exploration. There's Native Americans. Tell us, maybe, give us one story that you think is the most exciting from the book. Well, I really love the story of the very first expedition. Uh, I have to go back to about 1550, so the mid-16th century in England, when they were really facing a crisis, uh, economic crisis, social crisis, political crisis. But it was mostly economic. Uh, and the reason was that their their major product, which is woolen cloth, which they sold largely uh, on in continental markets, the market was kind of drying up. Uh, they had some currency issues and had an oversupply issue. And suddenly they were in, in, in kind of a uh, economic depression. 
And a group of merchants got together and said, we have to do something. And it's, it's not enough just to make incremental changes. We have to really do something big because we, we think England's actually in danger of going under. It's going to be taken over by Spain or we're going to, the economy is going to tank. And they said, we, let's, let's try to open up a new market somewhere beyond the continent. And so this group of merchants got together and they formed a, a joint stock company. And that's simply a, it's a company like a, co- a company today that you could buy a share of stock in. And they used the capital they raised, which was about 6,000 pounds, to uh, build three ships. And the idea was to go sail north and find the Northeast Passage, um, which basically would, they hoped, would take their ships, uh, allow their ships to sail along the northern margin of Russia and get to, to China, which they called Cathay at the time. Mm-hmm. And the reason they wanted to do that was that was the richest market on earth. It was, it was a huge market and it was a rich market and there were all kinds of goods and commodities there that Europeans and, and English people wanted. One of them was spices, but there are silks and other things. And they were there, they, they thought they would go there and trade their woolen cloth for these Chinese goods, bring back the Chinese goods, sell them, and they would open a whole new market. So the three ships set off and they ran into very bad weather. They could not find the opening to the Northeast Passage, which took another couple hundred years to find. Two of the ships uh, ended up being lost, but one ship made its way to uh, the northern coast of Russia, and the commander of that ship said, well, here we are in Russia. We couldn't get to China, which was the idea, but the even bigger idea was to find a new market. So Russia is going to be it. Let's, let's adapt. <laughs> So he made his way overland, which was not easy because it was winter, to Moscow, which was quite a trek. And he carried with him a letter from the King of England to any monarch he might come across. And he presented this to the Tsar of Russia, Ivan, who is the one who was later known as Ivan the Terrible. He wasn't, he wasn't terrible at that time. Um, and basically proposed that... Uh, that England and Russia opened trade relations, which they had not had for 500 years. And this guy, Richard Chancellor, who was the commander of a ship, was was not a diplomat, he was not even really a businessman, he was basically a mariner, Uh, but he was playing this role of of ambassador and negotiator, and he got the deal. (laughs) And Ivan said, uh, I don't know exactly what he said, we don't know that exactly, but he basically said yes, And so Chancellor came back to England with a deal, and that opened trade relations between England and Russia that continue today. And it was really this first step where the English said, oh, we we can do this. We can find a market. We can go beyond the continent. We can do more than what we've done in the past. We can succeed at this. I love that story. I was honestly, again, I was completely unaware of the Russian connection so i have to ask you was ivan surprised at this <laughs> kind of say you know i i really want to go to russia <laughs> and look into the archives of the kremlin which were opened up a few years ago and as i understand it there are millions of documents that have not been examined yet and i'm sure that there are documents there that record um, ivan's reaction to this mm-hmm. so we don't know uh <laughs> But we do know that he kept Chancellor waiting quite a while. And um, when he finally did bring Chancellor and his English compatriots into the Kremlin, which was operating at the time, um, he put on quite a show. But I think he was delighted. And um, so it, it did open this this trading partnership that was successful. Well, you mentioned Cathay and... and uh... And I'm interested in hearing a little bit more about that. the The alternative name for, I guess, is that was that considered North China during medieval Europe, or yeah, it's North China. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So tell us the role that that Cathay China played in all of this too, because that's a fascinating story. Well, what what's intriguing to me is that the English really didn't know that much about China. They would buy goods coming from China, but through middlemen uh, on the continent. So they knew that there were these wonderful goods 
largely spices. And, you know, we always hear about spices, but spices were important ingredients in, in food, but also as medicines. And so in a way they had this dream of China, of Cathay, that wasn't based on a whole lot of hard information, but they knew the goods were there and they were actually, you know, the literature that described Cathay at the time, a lot of it was dated. I mean, they were still reading Marco Polo <laughs> and his tales were written uh, 300 years before. And they kind of assumed nothing much had changed, which was not the case. So it, when you think about it, to, to make this, make a plan to sail from England to China through a passage that they didn't really know if it existed or not, no one that they knew of had ever sailed through it to make their way to the Chinese sea and then find, find Cathay and then be able to create a trade, trade relationships there is incredibly audacious, (laughs) you know, and it is almost, it's almost, um, it's, it's really an imaginary, uh, uh, an idea. It's a big, bold idea based upon not very much, but they were kind of desperate and they were quite excited and they knew that there were, there was a lot of richness there, but of course they never got there. (laughs) They, they tried and they, they tried many times and they kept thinking, we're going to find this Northern passage and it could have been to the Northeast, uh, across the, the top of Russia, or it could have been to the West, the Northwest passage across the top of America. And they, there were many ventures going out try, to try to find it, and they never did. And that's one of the reasons they got to America, was that in looking for the Northwest Passage, they kind of bumped into America and said, oh, here's another, oh, we could explore this place. And the intention, some of the intention on the part of the pilgrims was, uh, uh, you know, to sell cloth to the Native Americans, which maybe was a failed uh, or maybe too optimistic goal. Some of the early merchants uh, felt that, well, we sell woolen cloth. We know that these northern lands are cold. And so these people are probably cold. (laughs) And we know that our woolen cloth is very warm because we wear it and we like it. And um, they actually had a little trouble selling their, their cloth into southern continental markets because it was warmer there. And so one idea they had was we'll, we're going to open a huge market uh, with Indians in America and sell them our woolen cloth. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, again, it's, it's kind of charming that they thought they could do that. Uh, of course, it, that didn't work. The Indians were not at all interested. They had, first of all, they were incredibly hardy and didn't wear that much clothing. And when they needed to, they wore fur and they had plenty of fur and that was much warmer than woolen cloth. We are with John Butman, and John Butman is the co-author of the new book, New World Incorporated, The Making of America by England's Merchant Adventurers. It's an excellent book, and John, uh, it really is just a pleasure to have you here. I, I have just one final question, and that is maybe tell us a little bit about this cast of characters in the book, because it's just a, hmm. it's a really interesting group, but maybe specifically Hugh Willoughby and his contribution to the New World. <laughs> interesting. So... Uh, what we found was that we call it a, a constellation. Uh, and in the book, we, we list 75 people who we think of as being involved in the making of America before the pilgrims in this 70 year period. And we call it a constellation because for two reasons, one is that there were very different kinds of people in this, in this group of people who were interested in America. So you, they're largely driven by merchants uh, they were you know, driven by commercial interests and concerns, but they consulted and brought into their activity other kinds of people, including uh, courtiers, people who were in the royal court, who had the connections and the interest and often the money uh, to invest. But they also brought in uh, scientists, they brought in artists and writers and, so, uh, and craftspeople. So it, it wasn't just a business venture with business people involved. It was really this interesting group of, of people who brought different perspectives to it. And the second reason is that very often there were families involved. And over three generations, uh, families would kind of pass along this America obsession. And would the son would pick up where the father left off and then even 
the grandson would be involved. So we see these interesting groups of families in, interconnecting with um, with this constellation of different kinds of people from different disciplines. So it's interesting that you pick up on Hugh Willoughby. What what is it about him that that intrigues you? I just think he was one of the characters that, again, I was just completely unaware of and uh-huh. thought, I don't know. Yeah, he was a tragic character, but I, I suppose I, I saw the line, and this is not my line, but I saw the line, prophet, not piety. And I thought, uh-huh, yeah. okay, okay, there's an example of somebody who's thinking right along those lines. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, so, you know, there was another sort of motive involved in in this this activity to move out from England, which was glory right sort of personal glory but glory for england and it got all wrapped up in the profit motive but there was this additional element of this is something that's great to do it's it's a fantastic idea and it's big and it's going to elevate the status of england in comparison to what was then in in europe the major power uh, spain so uh, i think hugh Bill, hugh willoughby is is really interesting i'm 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 Really delighted that you picked up on, on him because <laughs> he's one of my favorite characters. Uh, so in this, the first voyage I mentioned that ended up in Russia, um, Willoughby was chosen as one of the commanders. I, I guess he was actually the main commander. He had absolutely no experience at sea. <laughs> so he didn't know much about ships, didn't know much about seafaring. He knew almost nothing about navigation. And he was chosen because they didn't really know what kind of leader you might need on this kind of expedition. But he was of a good family. He was very enthusiastic. He was excited. And he really wanted the job. He put himself forward to this this joint stock company that had organized this venture. And he said, you know, I really want to do this. And so their criteria for selecting a leader was good family title, we can trust him. The fact that he has no, no relevant skills didn't really come into the, into the picture. Uh, and the, the guy I mentioned, Richard Chancellor, who was uh, under Willoughby in terms of command, was a good navigator. So uh, off they went, and it's, it's really very sad because it's one of the big lessons they learned was that Willoughby, when they got up towards closer to the North Pole, uh, what happens is compasses are, are become far less accurate, especially the compass, compasses they had at the time, far less accurate. And he basically, his, his lack of navigational skills ended up killing him because they got lost. He, he got lost, his ship and one ship with him became completely disoriented. They lost their way. They were all planning to rendezvous at a certain spot. Willoughby couldn't get his ships there. He put in uh, on the north coast of Finland uh, for the winter, and there they froze to death. So his was a really sad end, but what happened was they, they learned, oh, uh, it's not enough to have a title. It's not enough to just uh, be excited. You need to have real skills to do what we're doing. And, you know, it's kind of an obvious lesson, but it's one that they hadn't learned yet, and they did from, from Willoughby. John Butman, co-author of the new book, New World Incorporated. It was named a Best History Book of the Month. And uh, John Butman's joined us today. John, thanks so much for talking to us today. This is, a, this is just a great book. Paul, oh, thank you so much. It was great talking with you. Nice talking to you too, John. Thank you. My thanks to our guest today, author John Butman. John Butman's latest book, along with co-author Simon Target, New World Incorporated, The Making of America by England's Merchant Adventurers, is part history book and part swashbuckling tale about the making of America and is really excellent. As usual, we'll post links to everything and also as usual, my thanks to you, the listeners, for joining me today. Your time is valuable and I'm grateful you're spending some of it with me. I'm always interested in feedback and you can leave that at iTunes, Google Play, or send me email at info at notold-better.com. Stay tuned for our next show, another great one, as we talk about better. The Not Old Better Show. Thanks, everybody. And remember to check out genealogybank.com slash N-O-B-S for great genealogy newspaper articles, history, and data, and to support the show. 
That's genealogybank.com slash N-O-B-S. Thank you.